Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Wherever you are joining us from, welcome to the University of Global Health Equity virtual grand round webinar series. Today, we will be discussing building sustainable research capacity in sub-Saharan Africa to detect emerging infectious diseases. Emerging infectious diseases such as COVID-19 have a devastating impact on health of millions of people around the world and especially in sub-Saharan Africa. As such, building sustainable research capacity through the development of innovative approaches and technologies to detect emerging infectious diseases is a viable strategy to combat the observed disparities in health outcomes. Sub-Saharan Africa has an acute shortage of highly trained research scientists. This is compounded by poorly resourced laboratories and may account for the very low scientific outputs from this region. This ultimately compromises the quality of evidence-based approaches to improve health systems. As such, strengthening research capacity in Sub-Saharan Africa should aim to increase opportunities for advanced research training at African institutions. This is especially true for female biomedical scientists who are poorly represented as well as capacitating local research labs to participate in cutting edge research. The objectives of our webinar today, we are actually aiming to explore the challenges faced by a lack of research capacity around infectious diseases in Sub-Saharan Africa. We will also examine the opportunities and innovations to address these research challenges and through training of equity-driven researchers in infectious diseases as well as explore the roles of external funders in financing research capacity strengthening activities. My name is Dr. Robert Ojambo. I'm uh, the chair of the Division of Basic Medical Sciences in the School of Medicine at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda, and I'll be hosting this session. To lead us in this discussion today, I have a panel of eminent speakers that are intimately involved in infectious diseases education, research, and research capacity building. We are privileged to have Dr. Patrick Orikiriza with us. Dr. Patrick is the head of microbiology in the Division of Basic Medical Sciences at UGHE. Before joining UGHE, he worked for 10 years as a microbiologist and the head of TB Research Laboratory for Epicenter, a research arm of MSF. He holds a PhD in health biology from Montpellier University in France, and he has taught microbiology previously at Mbarara University in Uganda for many years. Dr. Patrick has over 20 publications in the broad area of infectious diseases. We are also honored to have Professor Tim Curry with us. Professor Curry is the director of the Institute of Global Health equity research at UGHE. Uh, before starting at UGHE, his most recent academic roles were professor and director of Flinders University Center for Remote Health and Charles Darwin University's professor of clinical psychology in health equity in Alice Springs, Australia. He holds a PhD in clinical psychology and has taught for many years in Australia. Professor Tim sits on many academic and research boards he is a Fulbright scholar with over 150 scientific publications. In addition, we are also honored to have Professor Yimtu Bezinosh, Wolde Emanuel Molate. Professor Yimtu is an associate professor in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Parasitology at, at Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. She is a consultant microbiologist who has taught for over 20 years and supervised over 90 postgraduate students. Professor Yimdu has a diverse background in infectious diseases research, mainly focusing on the diagnosis of infectious diseases, antimicrobial resistance, including tuberculosis, and has more than 60 scientific publications. In addition, we are privileged to have Professor Gertrude Kiwanuka with us. Uh, Professor Gertrude is an associate professor as well as the Dean of the Faculty of Medicine at Mbarara University of Science and Technology in Uganda. Professor Gertrude holds a PhD in biochemistry from, from Mbarara University. She is well published and sits on many academic and scientific boards. She has been involved in teaching and research for more than 20 years. Professor Gertrude has also served as the Vice Chairperson of uh, Mbarara University Science and Technology Institutional research board 
for almost 10 years. In addition, she also served as a mentor in the PhD mentoring program for Karolinska Institute in Sweden and Marara University of Science and Technology. Her research interests revolve around a wide range of topics, including molecular studies and mechanisms of pathogenesis of infectious diseases, particularly malaria and HIV, to molecular mechanisms of non-communicable diseases, such as cancer, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. Last but not least, we are honored to have Dr. Simon Kay with us. Uh, Dr. Kay is the head of international operations at Wellcome Trust. Uh, Dr. Kay holds a PhD in cancer immunology. He has worked in different capacities around the world for the past 26 years as the head of international operations. Dr. Kay leads Wellcome's efforts to build biomedical and health research capacity in Africa and India. His teams at Wellcome work closely with Alliance for Accelerating Excellence in Science in Africa and with Wellcome Trust Department of Biotechnology, India Alliance, and provides governance and operational support to Wellcome uh, major programs in Thailand, Vietnam, Kenya, and Malawi. Please welcome our panelists. Uh, we are really honored to have these uh, distinguished speakers. Uh, before we start, I would kindly request all our panelists to mute their speakers unless they are actually speaking. Uh, for our participants, I would request you to share your questions, if you have any, through the Q&A chat box at the bottom of your screens. And for your information, this session will be recorded and disseminated through public channels. We also encourage all participants to share their thoughts on our Twitter handle, UGHE underscore org. All right, I uh, will start our discussion uh, by opening this. Uh, I'll start by asking uh, Professor Getrud and uh, Dr. Yimtu for their thoughts on what challenges to sub-Saharan African health systems they have observed within this current global pandemic and how this is disproportionately affecting vulnerable populations. In addition, if you could also speak on what learnings can be taken forward to support opportunities for research around infectious diseases in the future. Professor Getrude. Uh, thank you very much, Chair, yeah. and I am really pleased to be in this call this evening. And one of the things that I have noted uh, during this COVID-19 pandemic, which has affected the health systems is the maintenance of essential health services. And this has been partly because of the national measures which were put in place to try and curtail the spread of COVID-19. Among such were the restriction of travel which affected transport and that had implications, especially on pregnant women and we know that pregnant women are a vulnerable group of individuals. We had uh, scenarios where some pregnant women uh, eventually reached the hospitals with ruptured uterus. Others were forced to deliver along the way before they could reach the hospital. And in addition to that, we as a nation, we struggled with the numbers of patients in the hospital to the extent that many hospitals decided to send some patients back home. For instance, uh, surgery patients, many hospitals opted to have um, elective surgical procedures halted in preference to uh, uh, emergencies. And then because of such challenges, including some patients, the non-COVID-19 the non patients, for example, cancer patients, patients with renal conditions who are given the nature of their, their conditions require dialysis, you would find that some of those patients would not 
receive the regular timely management. And as a result of that, it kind of caused stress to the health workers and then hospitals started struggling with how to manage the health care's stress conditions. Then in addition to that, the other challenge that we have seen during this COVID-19 is the absence of expertise. And uh, much as we are looking at the expertise in terms of clinical laboratories, diagnostics, but this COVID-19 has opened our eyes to realize that by and large sub-Saharan countries and specifically my country, Uganda, we do not have specialized nurses, specific, specifically critical care nurses. And as I thought through some of the things that we really need to do as a nation, but also uh, sub-Saharan countries, we need to we need to provide support, we need to provide scholarships to nurses so that they go ahead and specialize in some of these critical uh, uh, specialized areas in their discipline. So that if anything happens later on in future, we will have a critical mass of nurses to attend to this. Then the other thing that I also want to make mention of is the need to develop capacity of laboratories. Many of our laboratories, they are not well equipped, even in terms of infrastructure. You find that many of our laboratories, the people who are managing those laboratories by and large are bachelors, they have bachelor's degrees. But with COVID-19, we have realized the need of training laboratory managers, even to the level of PhD. Because, for example, in Uganda, most laboratory uh, technicians, once they have received their bachelor's, they feel they no longer have to work in a lab. They want to move on to something else. They end up doing MPH and all these other courses. And then the other thing that we really need to emphasize and to strengthen as far as uh, building capacity in labs is concerned is for lab managers to embrace the use of information technology because it has been very challenging for laboratories, even centers where COVID-19 samples have been tested for them to release results in real time, summarize those results for purposes of research. So we need to strengthen that. We need to strengthen the issue of quality assurance as well as developing human resource and funding for laboratories. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Gertrude, um, for those comments. Um, Dr. Yimtu, do you have anything to add? Please go ahead. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, for inviting me to this webinar. And um, I think uh, most of the things that Professor said, uh, we also share in, uh, uh, in our setting. So uh, I think uh, already our health system in most African countries were already struggling before this global health crisis. And it's not that difficult to appreciate what uh, effects the current health crisis has or on uh, an already struggling health system. Uh, anyways, uh, having said that, you know, uh, the same thing like, um, you know, our health system, uh, one of the main struggles was, uh, you know, um, balancing between uh, uh, giving the due attention to the current pandemic and, uh, on the other hand, ensuring that the essential care for other diseases uh, such as uh, communicable and non-communicable diseases were one of the big challenges and um, which have been uh, in some places partially or completely disrupted. Uh, and then, um, you know, the healthcare facilities had to uh, reassign staff, you know, postpone some programs, prioritize and so on. So that has really um, had an effect on the health system in the, uh, as a whole. Um, another thing, uh, when we talk about the most vulnerable within our population that has been affected, you know, um, 
already uh, Africa is vulnerable, but we have uh, sections of uh, its society that are more vulnerable than others. And the current pandemic has been um, a real shock, uh, not only on the health system, but also disrupted, you know, various spheres of our social, economic and political lives. So it had uh, really be laid bare these ex existing disparities and um, deepening already existing inequalities. So uh, amongst us, the most vulnerable are women and girls, you know, uh, who have suffered like, you know, um, health wise, uh, socially, economically and so on. And uh, especially the girls, you know, they have, um, most girls are currently out of school because of school closures. So uh, this, um, some of them might not, might may never come back to schools because, you know, in some societies where they have to go back to the villages, uh, some of them are forced into early marriage. So that has really, that will affect the, you know, their future, the education system and so on. So um, I think most of the challenges that uh, Professor said we share also, but uh, not to repeat myself, so I'll go to the opportunities because in any, in any crisis, there is always an opportunity just to look out for it. So now, um, you know, uh, when we, I look back, uh, when we look at, back at the, you know, the laboratory capacity that we had for diagnosis of uh, SARS-CoV-2, the cause of uh, COVID-19, uh, at the start of the, when it was first reported, for example, in Ethiopia, samples had to be sent to, I think, to South Africa for diagnosis. But, um, and then we had one lab that was able to do the diagnosis, and now we have 48. So that was in a very noticeably short time that we did that. Uh, we were able to increase our capacity in the laboratory diagnosis. So I think uh, that is an opportunity to show us our capacity. So I think um, we should always be forward looking and uh, develop our infrastructures and systems of disease detection and identification and management. So, and uh, another thing that we have learned during this crisis is uh, the need for collaboration because this has affected the whole world irrespective of country. So, and then we see um, the good thing about collaboration, be it within the country, within our continent and beyond. So I think we should build up on that. So that's uh, the opportunities that I see within this um, uh, crisis. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yemchu and uh, Professor Gertrude uh, for that nice summary. Actually, you've explored uh, the challenges that uh, Sub-Saharan countries are actually facing in terms of uh, uh, the current pandemic, but uh, you've also discussed uh, the inequities that uh, vulnerable populations are particularly experiencing, but as well, you've also addressed the opportunities uh, that uh, can be exploited in terms of this challenge. Uh, you've talked of how the lab has been capacitated to actually conduct COVID-19 tests uh, within a very short period of time. So I want to turn our attention to vaccine research. Um, so I want to ask what barriers are there to vaccine research development in Sub-Saharan Africa and how can we accelerate access to vaccines to historically underserved communities? I'll address this to Dr. Patrick and uh, Professor Tim. Dr. Patrick, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Good evening, everyone. I think this is a very important topic that we are discussing today, considering the circumstances we are in at the moment. I would like to mention that uh, we have seen these emerging infectious diseases come to interrupt our already exhausted, exhausting uh, health system where we already see a lot of uh, infectious diseases that are common in Africa. So if we add these um, emerging infectious diseases, which we know will keep happening because of the globalization uh, that is taking place at the moment. So we think that a vaccine would be the best uh, solution to supplement, of course, the current available drugs that uh, we, are, we are still trying, actually, which we are also not uh, seeing very good uh, outcomes. But now 
the example of uh, this COVID-19 pandemic has shown us also that vaccine development requires uh, input from sub-Saharan Africa because we see that, for example, currently more than 150 uh, develop, drug develop, uh, vaccine developments are taking place around the world. But if we look at how many are involving some uh, sub-Saharan African countries, we don't see a lot of input from uh, these countries. Yet we know that at the end of the day, if we are going to use this vaccine, we need uh, information about some of the populations uh, in our in our African countries. So we have seen that data from children, for example, or elderly people or pregnant mothers is still not yet available. And yet we know that the first tracking of the vaccine is going to mean that maybe we are going to use this vaccine as soon as they are approved. So our concern is if we can have also uh, uh, some clinical trials in Africa, that would be very interesting. However, the lack of lab uh, capacity uh, hampers this development because if you see in most countries, they do not have enough lab infrastructure to be able to run uh, appropriate clinical trials which can inform of this information that we are talking about from the children, the elderly, the pregnant mothers. So for equitability or for, for equity distribution of the vaccines, we think we need a lab that can do good clinical trials in most of these regions. Uh, good enough, we see that countries are opening up. They are interested in doing this kind of vaccine uh, trials or clinical trials, but they still cannot afford to do this without laboratory infrastructure. So for me, I think that if we can improve funding, if we can get funding into infectious diseases research, then we are going to be able to, to bridge this gap between um, uh, the different country, countries which are developing the vaccine and also the ones where the vaccines are going to be uh, most needed. And of course, it will not only be for emerging diseases, but we think we need also vaccines for these infectious diseases that have been disturbing us for quite some time. And we don't think that if the trial is, if is successful in another country, it will guarantee the same uh, outcomes in uh, some of these developing countries. So UGHE, for example, would be a good platform or a, a place in uh, these uh, developing countries like, you, of course, Rwanda would be interesting if they can have capacity to run clinical trials or if they can train uh, future researchers who can be able to participate in uh, the development of these clinical trials, this would be very, very important. So this, the barrier for me would be the lab. If we can improve on the lab capacity and human resource, that would be uh, very successful. Thank you, Dr. Patrick. Uh, thank you very much for your comments. Uh, Professor Tim, please go ahead. Thanks, Dr. Robert. It's a huge privilege to be here tonight with, with the people we have, the panelists we have contributing. And, and really a, a lot of um, what I would say has, has already been covered, I think. Um, but it, it, is, it is essential in, in Sub-Saharan Africa to be, building, to be building capacity for the kind of research that we've been speaking about. Um, large multi-site clinical trials are obviously essential and we need we need skilled people to be able to, to conduct them. We need skilled researchers, but, but we also need, um, we, we've talked about the importance of laboratory managers, but, but for large uh, randomized controlled trials, we also need cl uh, trial managers. And, and so training in, in that area would be essential. Um, clearly there needs to be appropriate laboratory equipment so that skilled researchers can, can do the work that, they, um, that they're trained to do. 
but vaccine research doesn't doesn't happen in a in a vacuum either and we we need all stages of vaccine research to be well resourced and and well funded so once a fact a vaccine is developed um, it needs to be uh, implemented and, and disseminated so so there's a whole raft of implementation research that that needs capacity as well I, I think it's um, it's easy to focus on um, COVID-19 at, at this time of a of a global pandemic but but as Dr Patrick has pointed out the the need for infectious research um, is always there whether there's a global pandemic or not so I think I think we need to think um, more broadly than just the pandemic and be building research capacity so that vaccine research could be occurring routinely um, outside the context of a, of a global pandemic so that we're dealing with these problems even before they, they emerge, that we're able to, to predict them and have the, the necessary infrastructure and skilled researchers to be able to, to deal with them. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Tim. Uh, that's a very lucid summary. So clearly, uh, there's room to improve uh, capability in research as well. So uh, how can we then start to build sustainable capability in sub-Saharan Africa through education and medical training? And uh, what lessons can we apply from COVID-19 to support curriculum development and tailored postgraduate programs and inclusive opportunities for women. I would ask uh, Professor Geto to comment. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Robert. Uh, considering COVID-19 and the challenges that has come with this pandemic, the consequences that we are now struggling with and then the opportunities that are available to us. I'm thinking through and I am realizing that one way we can develop capacity, especially in institutions of higher learning is by deliberately engaging ourselves in mentoring of our graduate students. And when I talk about mentoring, I'm not just talking about the supervisor student and then they finish their training and they go away with academic paper. I'm talking about being deliberate in working with these graduate students, serving as role models, helping them to appreciate the importance of research and conducting research in a responsible manner and as they do that they develop their career they grow right to the point of establishing themselves as independent independent researchers because most of our institutions or many of the institutions in sub-saharan africa we still have the old generation seasoned researchers. But this is the time for us now to develop the young generation and to show them how they ought to conduct research. For them to motivate, for us to motivate them so that they pick the aspiration. And it, that is not only about research, but also clinical work. And when I say being deliberate in this, I am also looking at that partnership that we have with the Northern institutions. So that if an institution is in a collaboration with another institution in the Northern Hemisphere, then we can pair up our PhD students or we can pair up our clinicians with those seasoned researchers, seasoned clinicians, so that they have a pattern. They have someone to look up to, they have someone to, to get hold of their hand and show them what they ought to do. And other than mentoring, I am also looking at the challenge that we've been facing and we are still facing uh, in the sub-Saharan sub Africa the institutions in sub-Saharan Africa. 
And this has so much to do with, if we are going to develop research, if we are going to develop research capacity in our institutions, that should begin from identifying what problems we have. Even when we don't have money, it is we who know what problems we have. We should be engaged from the very, very beginning at the onset, like at the time of writing a proposal, rather than always getting these proposals written. So there should also be willingness from our partners, our collaborators with money to involve us in setting our research agenda, in setting the research question, and right up to dissemination of findings, we should be involved. That is one way of developing capacity. Then lastly, I just want to say that COVID-19 is opening our eyes to realize that we actually are families whether we are poor, whether we are rich, but as a human race, we are one family. And the earlier we realize that we are each other's brother's keeper, the better. Why am I saying this? I am saying this to um, mention that it is high time that institutions of higher learning, countries and regions, start looking at one health approach as a very, very important element when we talk about curricula, especially curricula for the health profession disciplines. Because COVID-19, and not only COVID-19, but also other infectious diseases like Ebola, like uh, East Africa, uh, coast fever. We have these diseases which have crossed the borders from one country to another. And especially those diseases which bring in the animal human ecosystem interface. Most of our medical schools or our colleges of veterinary medicine, we teach our students in fragmented ways like you teach the nursing students, nursing science, you teach the medical students how to diagnose, how to treat a patient, but then there isn't that connection. There isn't that connection. What is the community? How can we bring the community on board? How do we bring those in environmental science on board? How do we bring the social scientists, social scientists on board? So I am thinking that as we go forward, with or without COVID-19, because today it may be a pandemic, tomorrow it's going to be an epidemic, but an epidemic which is going to cross maybe from Ethiopia to another country. So that alone should help us, or it should open our eyes to realize the importance of having one health approach or one health principles incorporated in the curricula for the training of students who are pursuing health profession disciplines. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gertrude. Um, Dr. Yemtu, do uh, you have any additional comments? Please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so uh, it's a very um, interesting question. You talk about are asking us about sustainability and then also uh, women. So uh, I'm just picking up the keywords. So uh, I think uh, what the current pandemic has really made us realize is uh, our lack of uh, uh, laboratory diagnostics uh, capacity in Africa. Uh, and then when I think of what Africa needs, Africa needs diagnostics and uh, access to medicine. So um, then uh, in, in view of this, you know, we have to look at our um, curriculum development and so on. Uh, but uh, generally, you know, to build, um, we need to build uh, critical mass, uh, build their capacity, 
and sustain the capability. This by itself is a process. Uh, and then uh, the process, uh, to start this process, I think we need uh, to have in place um, special, I mean, postgraduate programs that are really tailored to diagnostics, drug and vaccine development. So, and then uh, we really have to rethink because um, we really have to rethink our understanding of our challenges itself, how we build sustainability, uh, sustainable capability in Sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, I believe that it, it also uh, um, needs increased engagement of the different stakeholders, like um, for sustainability needs investment, infrastructure, uh, building on local knowledge and um, uh, the need for funders which are committed to supporting us in building our infrastructures and equipping our laboratories. So in addition to that, of course, governments taking ownership and uh, closer understanding of academic institutions and then uh, academic institutions being uh, forward looking and constantly and timely uh, revising their curriculums. Uh, which are uh, and then having conducive working environments and also retaining the trained researchers. We have the researchers, even though I mean trained researchers uh, from Africa. So we we have to be able to retain them in Africa. And then uh, even when we look at the medical education, uh, the pandemic has also um, affected it in a very special way that um, you know the this. Uh, and pharmaceutical um, infection control um, um, strategies that are put in place like uh, physical distancing has really affected the key component of medical education uh, that is uh, authentic patient experiences. So um, this might also need curriculum adjustments, you know, incorporating new principles, practices, approaches uh, that we need uh, in our medical education system and in curriculum, like such as putting in place uh, telehealth and others. So, um, and then uh, the other thing is, uh, you know, in, in order to change curricula, I think we really need our, um, you know, to learn from our, uh, what we are going through, you know, to document it, analyze it and see how it will influence our curriculum going forward. So I think our uh, curriculum should be robust and um, very dynamic. And then uh, coming to uh, how uh, inclusive our curriculum should be to women, because it could it should be inclusive. But uh, one challenge that I have seen is you know uh, when we try to have uh, we have one program in uh, in our uh, in one um, program that I'm involved in where our funders require us that 50% of uh, the, you know, the trainees should be women. And we have struggled to have the 50%. The problem is that we don't have enough women in the pipeline that could go into these programs. Uh, at various level of education system, uh, there is a lack of uh, women that go beyond master's program. So these are some of the challenges that really we need to understand and try to solve because um, how much do we understand the challenge? You know, we need uh, to start um, rethinking this also. And then uh, we need to start systematically to build the pipeline, starting from high school, support them through their first degrees and build further on this so that we get enough women to come into the, to the it's, you know, uh, putting um, goals is not enough, but working toward that goal is very important, I think. So there are many things that are challenging us, like our culture, you know, the general ecosystem of higher learning institutions and others. So uh, I totally agree also with the professor that we need this mentorship program in this, and especially to help women and others also, everyone, of course. So with that, we can build uh, enough um, uh, manpower and we need, we can sustain our, you know, capable, capability going forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Yimtu, for those valid comments. And uh, clearly, uh, we have to be very innovative in our education and, and research to address the, the challenges you both have highlighted. Um, so alongside uh, building capacity through basic science education, there's a need to build uh, capacity as well in low-resource countries 
for facilities to help further research around infectious diseases. I'm now going to ask Professor Chim and uh, Dr. Patrick what this capacity should look like in terms of space, staff, and systems to help further preparations for and preventions of future infectious disease outbreaks. Please go ahead, Professor Chim. Thanks, Dr. Robert. Um, yeah, it, it is. It's hugely important that we get that we get these sorts of things right. I think. Um, we know that the kind of systems that we need and the, the resourcing that we need, what, what we don't know so well is how to adapt it to local context. And that's where I think the, the expertise of um, researchers in sub-Saharan Africa can, can guide the, the funding channels and the resourcing that needs to be applied. I think some of the, the points that have already been raised by Professor Gertrude and Professor Yimtu are, are absolutely critical that I think COVID has taught us the more than ever before the value of collaboration and cooperation. I think there are international um, collaborations that we could be leveraging off. I think internationally people could be learning just as much from sub-Saharan Africa as people in sub-Saharan Africa can be learning from other places. That it really is if we're going to be building research capacity and capability that it it's very much a partnership that we need to be working with other people in, in different jurisdictions and different places so that we can all benefit from, from the, the skills and expertise and, and the funding of, um, of different places. You know, f um, everyone speaks about funding. We clearly need funding to be able to, to work effectively and efficiently and to do the jobs that, that we're all trained to do. But funding is also a, a finite resource, so we have to get um, we have to get smarter about the way that we, we use the resources that are available. And that's where I think the, the collaborations and partnerships and cooperation that we've talked about um, are so essential. So that's, that's at a, a systems level. We've already talked about the, the essential need for adequately resourced laboratories so that people can do um, their, their work properly. And, and get the, the results that are going to be important and that are robust and, and rigorous. I absolutely think that focusing on um, researchers is, is important, but it's also starting a little late and the, the, the need to go back to high schools and undergraduate training and look at the resourcing there is, as we've already heard, is, is absolutely critical as well. So I think, um, at, at, We've heard about the importance of One Health, but I, I think thinking holistically about a whole bunch of things is, is really critical and not looking at isolated segments. So for research, we need to be thinking about the, the broad spectrum of research that can occur in, in the, the area that I know well in, in rural and remote Australia, there was a, a, a large amount of um, prevalent studies and descriptive studies conducted. And it, it seems to be the, uh, a bit the same in sub-Saharan Africa. And I know there was a call in Australia that um, while prevalence and descriptive studies are important, there needs to be other research programs going on as well, that it's not just good enough to know how often something is occurring, but we need to know what to do about it. And we need to know um, when we've got the technology to help we need to know how to get that technology to, to the people who it can help, to the vulnerable population, so that we can start having an impact on, on inequity. So, so getting all of those things right and adequately resourced is, is really, really critical. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Tim, um, for those comments. Uh, Dr. Patrick, do you have anything to add? Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to add that uh, Training is also very important to have at least trained trainers. So having advanced programs which can uh, train people to be able to train those who will uh, be the masters in, uh, in preparing for some of these uh, epidemics would be int interesting. Um, for example, if you have a pool of trained uh, people in detecting and surveying for these epidemics, it would be, it would help uh, when the time, when the epidemic comes or when they, these emerging diseases appear, 
you have already a team that you don't have to waste a lot of time uh, training people afresh and then deploying them. Also, if you have people who are experienced in uh, research, who have been trained and who have participated, uh, especially during their training programs, I think that would help a lot in, um, in addressing some of these uh, challenges. So in terms of equipment, I noticed that we, we need, as we talk about laboratories and the space, we could also have good collaborations where we can have some kind of donations of equipment uh, to support the training programs, but also to support the research capacity. So if we can have capacity in terms of human uh, resource, but also in terms of laboratory infrastructure, we would be uh, at a point where we can create a mass of uh, researchers that will help us to address uh, most of these infectious and uh, emerging infectious and also the already existing infectious diseases. Um, thanks. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patrick. So clearly you are indicating uh, the role of uh, maybe external partners to support these capacity building initiatives. Uh, so I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Simon Kay how investors and philanthropists play a collaborative role in helping finance health research capacity strengthening activities in Sub-Saharan Africa, looking specifically at infectious diseases, as well as supporting individual research to develop contextually relevant solutions to problems seen in their respective countries. Uh, Dr. Kay. Great, let me just check first of all that you can hear me and see me. We can hear you. So, good afternoon, everyone. I'll, I'll just say it's, it's a, a huge privilege that you've asked me to contribute and I do feel really humbled by the presentations that have gone before. So I, I hope that what I can add will be useful. And um, it, I found it really interesting so lis listening to you all. So, so thanks very much for in inviting me. Um, just to say, I'm, I'm sitting here in, in West Sussex in, in the UK on a very rainy, summery day. Um, so look, I've prepared a few slides and I, and I hope they will address the, the questions you'd ask. And I just thought I would reflect from a distance on, on what it looks like from the perspective of a funder. And I hope that my perspectives will be interesting. Um, so I think I'm supposed to say um, next to um, Laura, who's hitting the slide. So do you now see a map of the world? Yep, I'm sure that everyone here has seen a map of the world before. Yes. And when my colleague prepared this, it was really to make the point that you know we may may sit in London, but what's really important to us, particularly when I look at the you know the, the the map of Africa, that what is really important to us is that we're increasingly seeing ourselves as a funder that's operating at a very long arm's length, and we use this phrase a lot called um, shifting the centre of gravity that some of you might might have heard. So for us, it's actually incredibly important that although we might make a major funding decision, which is to award significant sums of money to bodies like the African Academy of Sciences in Africa and the India Alliance in India, we now want those decisions on funding to be made as close as possible to where, let's call it the action or, or the, the need is. And so as far as possible, we are not making detailed funding decisions in London. So that's the first thing I want to say. So this is obviously from the perspective of, of welcome. And my next comments will say a little bit about, you know, how we look at that. So could you go to the next slide now, which should be three. Um, and I've written these notes, it's really as much as a reminder to myself. So I'll just read what I've written here. So the funder or investor must test their own appetite and tolerance for risk. So what do I mean by that? That if a funder like Welcome or an investor is going to actually shift responsibility or shift decisions for funding, then there is a, there is a level at which you might accept a higher tolerance for risk, you know, risk perhaps in terms of the outcomes or the decisions may not be exactly what you would have made yourself. But for an organization like Welcome, which is an independent foundation, we can do that. For government funders that that can be more difficult 
And at the same time, that funder who's letting go of control must ask themselves, what are they prepared to give up? And these aren't casual statements. These are really important statements that a funder needs to ask oneself is that if I am going to shift responsibility and shift leadership, what element of control am I prepared to get up, give up? So again, these are just perspectives of the way of thinking about funding. Could you go to the next slide, please? So on this one, um, it's essentially what I just said. So it's shifting that center of gravity of funding and decision making. And the example I'll give here is that some of you in the audience will probably know that Welcome and the Gates Foundation and DFID work very closely with the African Academy of Sciences where we set up a funding, if you like, body called AISA, the Alliance for Accelerating Science um, in, in Africa. This is incredibly important to us because by essentially giving them the funding, we're allowing many funding decisions now to be made in Africa and not in London. This is really important to us. Um, and their funding, as some of you will know, will then goes to support what's called the Deltas Initiative, which is a pan-African um, um, funding scheme, which is built around multi-country, multi-institution consortia. And I can't tell you the number of times that the program directors have said to me the pride they take in acknowledging and communicating that as African program directors, they're in full control of the budget. There is no Northern partner they have to ask for guidance. They can seek support if they want from a Northern partner, but that's down to them if they want that collaboration. For us, the most important thing is the inter-Africa collaboration. Could you move to the next slide? This is again something I just thought of, you know, when you're writing a short sort of talk, you sort of think of what are the things that are important to you. And I can't tell you actually, when I started this job, how I'd get my head bitten off um, by African partners when I would talk about scientific excellence. And I think it took me a few years to understand the perspective. And I guess what it means is that excellence isn't just about publishing in, in Nature or, or BMJ or wherever. Excellence might be defined by qualities of leadership and excellence might be defined by qualities of engagement. Our African partners should be determining what you mean by excellence. Theories of change are important because these are outcome models which help define and describe how a funding scheme is put together. And again, what I've learned over the last few years, it's really, really important that we collaborate in defining output and outcome measures, that we collaborate in defining key performance indicators and measures, et cetera. Good, I hope this is sort of clear. Can you go to the next slide, please? It's always a nice mystery for me to see what slide will come up next. Um, yeah, this is another important point. Obviously, your researchers are based in institutions. And as a major funder, we don't expect African institutions to say, to have the same levels of cash that we have. I sort of understand that. But we do increasingly want to see that institutions take a serious stake in these training programs. And that could be through creating um, postdoctoral positions. It could be the funding of labs, which we know that happens. It may be cash. It may be their overhead contributions, but being much clearer about the stake that you have in that collaboration. This is really important to us. And of course, it's only those institutions that can establish and define career pathways. We can't do that. You can. Next slide, please. Um, actually, look, this is a really cool slide, but. When I first started this job, I remember seeing a presentation where the models of collaboration really looked like um, airline networks flying out of Africa. You know, these were maps that sort of showed the, you know, thick lines showed strong collaboration. Um, it has, in my view, changed over the last few years. We are seeing more 
intra-African collaboration. We want to see more of it. And, you know, we support and want to see more funding structures that incentivize and motivate intra-African collaboration. Next slide, please. Um, it's really important to us and other funders now that there are supportive research and institutional cultures. And by this, we mean, for example, removing obstacles to women's careers. Um, we mean mechanisms in place to allow whistleblowing, um, cultures that are supportive of mentoring and um, cultures, I guess, that will not tolerate poor behaviors. Um, and I say this absolutely as much as my own country as anywhere else. And finally, next slide, please. Um, you know, funders have a lot of influence. And one of the things that we want to influence is that researchers aren't only thinking about publications, which is important, but they're incentivized to engage with their communities, if relevant, with policymakers and the public, not just to communicate the results of their science, but building confidence in science. And we all know at this time of COVID how incredibly important it is that the public can trust science. And then finally, with the final slide, please, um, and this has been picked up by um, all of the speakers, really. It's really important that, that governments and philanthropists or African governments and philanthropists are investing in, in you, investing in career pathways. And of course, external organizations like ours and others are important. Um, but it worries me when I don't see, match funding doesn't have to be one-to-one, -one, but match funding is partly about the cash but it's also about taking a strong stake and being a strong stakeholder in those funding decisions and ensuring that the research that is funded is, is relevant and is demanded by the researchers and, and, and the country. So we'd like to see more mechanisms for shared and pooled funding. Does this say increase that stake and increase the pool? Um, I'll stop there and I hope that that's been useful. And I'll say again what a privilege it is to, to sit alongside the, the other panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. K, uh, for that presentation. Um, we are now moving into the Q&A session. Uh, we have received uh, several questions. We'll attempt to address some of these questions. There are many, given the time we have. And I'll start off by asking you, Dr. K, who was the most recent speaker. Um, so besides relying on external funders in financing research capacity, as well as supporting individual researchers to develop contextually relevant solutions and advance national health priorities in the field of research, do you believe that countries, uh, that is governments and research institutions in sub-Saharan Africa are ready to support each other in the field financially and in the use of research findings? Well, of course I'm gonna say yes. <laughs> You would not expect me to be so dipl undiplomatic as to say no. So I've got maybe two or three ways of answering the question, and please hope I do answer, and I'll try to be brief. I think the first is that personally, I obsess about matched funding, but in my language, match doesn't mean one-to-one. -one. Um, you know, co-funding, depending on the, if you like, the wealth of the country, might be at 10%, it might be at 1%, but it's some kind of stake, which might be cash, it might be commitments to fund postdocs. Um, it might be, you know, commitments to, 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 to build laboratories. So that's one answer. My other answer is that I work very closely with Aouda Nepad, which most of you will know is the agency that works um, under the African Union responsible for implementation of science and technology programs across Africa. And I, I've got to be careful because I'm not sure how well known this is. But certainly I know that a new Pan-African fund is being established that I think that governments will be requested to invest into. So, you know, I always like to be, let's be modest, let's be realistic, but I take that as a really positive sign. And I think if there's any good to come out of COVID and, you know, let's not romanticize COVID, but it is this massive wake up call to all of us, how important it is, not just to have 
um, you know, the obviously the, the vaccines and the therapeutics, but if every country to have its own pool of trained and trusted researchers and scientists who policymakers can turn to. And I think that, if anything, now is catalyzing governments to recognize the importance of investing in its own science and technology base. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, so the next is we're looking at uh, infectious diseases and uh, infectious disease in nature are complex and require multidisciplinary collaboration. Today, the education systems are still training the future generations in a silo-based manner. So what can be done to embrace multidisciplinary training to be able to prepare a future workforce well for the future challenges? And uh, this is addressed to all the panelists. So please go ahead if you are comfortable to respond. I mean, I, I don't mind jumping in, but I feel I'm hogging the microphone. Um, Please go ahead. But I'll make it brief so the others can talk. I mean, I, I already did put an answer in, in the chat box, but, you know, I, I'm a real believer in this model that we've developed with the African Academy of Sciences, where we're funding through multi-country, multi-institution consortia. Um, and, you know, so that actually guarantees diversity. It guarantees inclusion. And almost certainly the model allows you for, for example, putting it really simply, to mix social scientists with epidemiologists, um, you know, to bring in sort of um, health economists, etc. Et so, you know, I think it's useful in meetings like this to give practical answers. So I would advocate that the consortium model is a powerful way of doing this. And it's also incredibly important that all of us are committed to fostering intra-African collaboration to achieve this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any other addition? Panelists? If not, I'll ask Professor Kiwanuka. Uh, the problem we have faced in Sub-Saharan Africa is based on financial capacity and for most young graduates in the health sector who have limited resources to pursue higher training in PhD and masters. Uh, could you address how to maybe solve this problem? Professor Kimanuka. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Robert. I, I think one way to solve that challenge is to have the seasoned researchers or anyone who is involved in a well-funded research project to always include training as a component when they are responding to a call uh, so that the research which is being conducted does not only end with publications and with just a uh, change in policy. So if we deliberately try, especially if the funder is okay with that, so that any project which is bringing in some sizable amount of money also includes that component. But also the other thing is to to try as much as possible to engage our governments, if only the education sector can have that budgeted for every time we have these financial budgets presented to the governments for funding. I mean, each time we receive funds, especially for institutions which are being supported by governments, if we can engage our governments if we can lobby for more funds to support phd students it may not really be supporting all their training but at least there should be some amount of money that the government contributes to support phd training especially in terms of uh, supporting their research projects. Then the other thing that I am also thinking about are the institutions themselves 
also to save money and in addition to retaining graduate students like as a as a way of um, stimulating the desire for these young scientists to continue with their training from bachelor's to master's degree and then to PhD. If only institutions can always save some money to support PhD students so that we always have a pool. We get money from external funding, which comes in as research projects, funded research projects. Then we get money from our governments dedicated to the training of PhD students, but also institutions themselves. For example, money which is generated internally, if institutions can also set aside some amount of money, especially to train PhD students or contributing to their research. I think that would support so many PhD students with limited funding. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, uh, Professor Gertrude. Uh, so for Professor Chim, in, in uh, respect to vaccinations, uh, in terms of implementation, there has been considerations of what will be done when proportions of populations refuse vaccinations. I don't know how you could address uh, populations that are resistant to vaccinations. Do you have any comments? If I can find my mute button, I do. Yeah, um, thanks so much, Dr. Robert, for the, for the question. That's, um, it's, a, it's a wonderful question. It speaks very much to, to the heart of, of things that I, um, I think are really important in terms of the, the implementation of, of research findings. And I think um, in some ways, th this area um, really highlights a, a little bit of um, a shortfall that, that's occurred in, in the research process over, over a long period of time. I think we've, we've done a pretty good job um, at disseminating research findings generally, mostly in you know, peer reviewed scientific publications and so on. I don't think um, as, as Dr. Simon pointed out, I think the, the trust of the public is, is hugely important in, um, in the research endeavor. And I don't think we've done such a great job of, of, of um, communicating to the public. And I think that's where um, sometimes problems like um, the way people think about vaccines and immunizations and so on, can come in, so I think we need to do a, a lot better job of, of that. Um, and, and I think we also need to do a, a much better job of, of being able to think about and demonstrate research impact. I don't know that we've always done a great job of that. I, I still don't think we're doing a, a very good job of it in, in lots of ways. And I think um, that research impact needs to be something that we plan at the very outset of the the research process, just as in, as we're developing important research questions that are going to guide the research process, I think we should be thinking about, and I think funders should be demanding to know what the the long term research impact is going to be of of the particular project that they're funding. You know, we heard a uh, in the last uh, in an implementation science webinar um, a couple of weeks ago that it can take up to seventeen years sometimes for research results to to make it into to practice well i think that's just bonkers you know we we would refuse to accept that in other areas if if an engineer told you that they were going to take 17 years to fix the bridge across the river we would we would refuse um to to put up with that so so i think it's it's really um a, a shortfall and I, I think we we spoke earlier about the way that we've categorized different um different areas that nurses get nurse training and medicos get me medical training. Well, I think we've done the same thing in, in research. And I think the implementation science field is fantastic in lots of ways. But I also think it's a bit of a, a, a sign of the weakness in the research process that we needed to create a whole new field to talk about the implementation of our results. 
Um, I've looked a, a bit ahead through the, the question and answer session and there's a, a, an, another excellent question about the return of investment in, in research. I'll be interested to hear um, Dr. Simon's views on that, but, but I think that's a really, a really crucial question that gets at, at some of the values of our society. You know, why are funders funding research and how do you put a, a value on, you know, finding a, a, an effective treatment that means young children can spend more time in school than they, than they had before? And perhaps the results, um, the, the benefit of that treatment isn't known for, for another 17 years. So I think there are a really fundamental, almost philosophical questions that, that we have to grapple with. And I think it's, it's about researchers working closely with funders, um, but also getting much better at, for me, the, um, the, the issues and topics about research impact are absolutely critical. Even, even for laboratory scientists, I, I, I include them, I think, I think all researchers should should have to be able to, at the outset of their research, should have to be able to, to make a, a, a compellingly persuasive case about what the impact of their of their research activity is going to be. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Professor Chim. Just to follow up on what you've just said, uh, Dr. K. So how can we figure out where return on investment in terms of improvement in health outcomes is greatest? I think that's a really hard question. So I don't thank Professor Tim for um, passing me that question. Um, so as he said it, I was just making some notes to figure out what would happen if you asked me that question. Um, so what I've thought here is a couple of things. I think first of all, you know, as a research funder, I, we don't really use the phrase return on investment, but I, I get what it means. But that sort of determining and measurement of outcomes, I'd say almost is the, is the holy grail. And at Wellcome, there's been a lot of work the last few years, you know, shifting ourselves from what was a traditional research funder where we sort of valued publications to a much broader set of impacts now, you know, which might be around, um, well, there is still something about, you know, research and, and new knowledge. Um, there is something about how research is translated into health policy or, or health practice. Um, you know, we're interested in evidence for um, people and, and public engaged but then I reflected more thinking that's still not a very interesting answer and if I go back to one of my slides where I talked about participating in the theory of change I think what would be really powerful would be you know you know, you know institutions like your institution in, in Rwanda and others playing actually a much stronger part in actually determining these theories of change and actually being participants in actually determining what gets measured um, I don't know, I hope I'm not avoiding the question, but I, that's what I was really trying to urge in my presentation about how can we be more collaborative and participative in actually deciding what is the appropriate return on investment. It might be as profound and simple as sort of lives saved or, you know, uh, you know, or, uh, years of healthy life extended. But certainly for a funder like Welcome Now, it's much, much more about the impact on health. And, much le and I'd say the outcome, the impacts on health are really much more at the outcome level now, whereas I'd say the research outputs are probably one level below. I don't know whether that answers the question, Tim, or whether that meets your challenge of passing it to me. It's good for me, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully, thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. K. Um, Dr. Patrick and uh, Dr. Yimtu, uh, if we are strengthening our research capacity, but not understanding of its need reception in our countries, I feel progress will still be largely stunted in as much as there's a need to develop research capacity in terms of the microbial side. How are we or should we also develop research on the educational and social aspects of clinical research? Dr. Patrick and then uh, Dr. Yemtu, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair, and a uh, very important question also. So um, I, I think as we go into, for example, clinical research, if we, if we, we have uh, um, funding for clinical research, um, especially in educational institutions, we have an opportunity to, to 
kill two birds with one stone. So as we are improving on the uh, research uh, data, as we get data from the research, we also have an opportunity to improve, for example, on microbiology uh, um, investigation, infectious diseases component, which we can use to, to train um, students, for example, if it's in a, a, an institution, educational institution. So by improving on uh, research in infectious diseases, we also give students an opportunity to learn some of these infectious diseases that we encounter through uh, research. So I think the two can be, um, can work together. You can find the benefit in education while you're also benefiting in research at the same time. So I, I think that would be uh, my, my take. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Patrick. Um, Dr. Yimtu, anything to uh, add? I don't know if I got the question right, but um, uh, it's about, um, if it's about uh, increasing clinical research, um uh, what um what i see is uh, now i'm working in a medical school so uh, the collaboration with an you know the i'm a, a basic scientist um, basic science researcher but uh, uh, i work in a medical school so uh, the collaboration between departments and then you know research and uh, clinical um, I mean, education is interlinked there so i think um, like um, Dr. Patrick said, what is done in basic science also going to clinical research can be interwined and looking at the basic um, questions that can arise can be really answered in that way. So I think uh, the benefit of having that uh, collaboration between different, uh, you know, uh, researchers within an institution or beyond can also give that kind of uh, input into the clinical research. Uh, but I'm not sure I got the question right. I hope I have answered some of it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yumtu. And uh, I thank all attendees for their questions. Um, all questions that have been unanswered within this section because of time limitations will form part of the webinar follow-up. And uh, to summarize, uh, I thank our panelists and uh, to summarize our discussion today, um, uh, we basically are very grateful for your attendance. Uh, this has been a very fascinating debate around building sustainable research capacity in sub-Saharan Africa to prevent, prepare for, and uh, respond to emerging infectious diseases. Our discussion acts has followed from looking at the immediate challenges to sub-Saharan African health systems we are observing with this current global pandemic and how this is disproportionately affecting vulnerable populations to looking at barriers to vaccine research and how we can accelerate access to vaccines for historically underserved communities. We have discussed building capacity through training, the next generation of equitable health leaders and how women must be part of the pipeline, as well as building capacity in low resourced countries for facilities to help further research. Uh, videos and audio recordings of this session will be available on our website, that is ughe.org, and across our social channels as well. I thank you very much, our panelists, for this brilliant discussion we've had, and I thank attendees for your attentive, uh, or rather your attention in this discussion. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Robert. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Robert. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, team. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, team. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Nice to meet you all. Bye.